Verse number 10, Romans chapter number 8. The Bible says, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of your body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, I'm not going to lie. Last night when I went to bed, completely different Sunday school lesson, Brother Lancaster. <laughs> and then I woke up at 6 o'clock this morning. Those of you that know me know it takes an act of God to wake me up at 6 o'clock on a Sunday. And it is hot off the presses. So, verse number 10, really verse number 11, we find the definition of what it is to be revived. You're not going to find the word revived or revival in the New Testament. You'll find many references in the Old Testament where they pleaded for the Lord to revive them. But in the New Testament, we find a different word. We find it in verse number 11. It says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwells in you. Now that word quicken means to make alive, right? To revive. Okay, now, when you got saved, your soul was made alive, verse number 10, right? If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Your body's still dead. But your soul was made alive and then sealed with the Holy Ghost, meaning it's alive forevermore. Right? Your conversation's already recorded in heaven. There's nothing in heaven, in hell, or on the earth that can change the fact that your soul is alive if you have been saved. Revival is not about your soul being quick, and that happened to Calvary. Right? Revival is about your spirit being made quick, or the quickening of the spirit. Now your soul, that's the part of you that lives on forevermore. The spirit is, for lack of a better term, your will. Right? Your consciousness. The conversation in your head that happens between you and you alone, and should happen also with God, but some people don't do that. But it's that dialogue you've got going on inside of your head that decides what you do, why you do it, when you do it. Right? Your spirit is what makes the decision on how you live your life. Yet now, we know that his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. So what does that tell us? That the spirit of God can talk to your spirit. I can't talk to your spirit. Right? I can talk to you. The spirit in me can talk and you can receive it, but we can't have a dialogue just between my spirit and your spirit. Now every now and then, the Bible also says that the spirit in me bears witness that other people have the same spirit in them. So God's Spirit tells me that other people are saved, right? That we're our brethren, right? So we know that our Spirit and the Spirit of God two different things, but He did seal us. He's a part of us, right? Those things can carry on a conversation. Right, we're laying some groundwork here. Bear with me. That's right, so when you got saved, your soul was already made alive. Your flesh will always be dead, and your spirit is caught between the, t the two. Look with me in verse number 12. Thus, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Well, what makes the decision on whether you're going to live after the Spirit or live after the flesh? Your Spirit. Right? We live after the capital S, Spirit. Right? We live after God. And that is when we are revived. That's when we're quickened. The whole purpose of the Holy Ghost quickening your flesh was so that you could live a holy, righteous, and justified life before God in this dead flesh. He said, if your spirit follows after God, the spirit will quicken your bodies to where you can do those things which are good to the Father. It's still dead, but your flesh can be made to do right. right? You aren't destined to live with a soul that is saved and on its way to heaven in flesh that causes you to sin every day. No, in fact, he made us kings to rule and reign over this flesh to bring it into subjection and live as a child of God. 
that he that's in you is greater than he that's in the world that your flesh is dead but it can be made to do things that please the Lord All right, that's what verse number 13 is talking about but then in verse number 14 it says but as many as are led by the spirit of God they are the sons of God our spirit either leads or, it, or I mean follows or it rebels did not Jesus say man cannot serve two masters or love one and hate the other well who are the sons of God indeed not in name there's a lot of people claim to be but then there are those that actually live it right who are the sons of God indeed the ones that follow after the spirit they follow they humble themselves like we talked about last week right they admit Lord you're in control I don't know what's going on didn't know what was up or down before you turned the light on when I was out in the darkness of sin now by faith I'm just going to follow after you lead me by your spirit what's that saying Lord make sure my spirit is in line with your spirit that's the true purpose of prayer by the way prayer really picks up when we get our spirit in line with God's spirit and we start praying what God wants us to pray where we get to the point where there's nothing between us and him and truly our spirit is talking through the Holy Ghost who takes our prayers to the throne room of God right our spirit is directly talking with God it's not the flesh it's not my ego it's not my desires it's not my wants it is the spirit that he quickened in me but that's truly when prayer rubber meets the road there Right? Why do you think it's so hard to get down and actually pray? Because we've got to get the flesh out the way first. Right? We've got to bring under subjection our minds, our thoughts, our emotions, right? our desires, and we've got to put them on the shelf. Right? Well, in this verse, we find, see, we could say, let's put it this way. Okay, God the Father wants all of his children to live in a constant state of revival well you say well what's revival that's where your spirit's in line with the spirit of God and you do mortify the deeds of your flesh so that you live as God wants you to live now what's that word mortify mean right that word originally was used for things like gangrene right well what's gangrene it means that something's still attached to you but it's already dead and because it's dead Right? It's going to have an impact on the body. A lot of times if something's gangrenous, you got to cut it off. Right? Well, here it's saying in verse number 13, right? but if ye through the Spirit, capital S, do mortify the deeds of your body, ye shall live. Now, based off of the definition we just gave, that seems like a contradiction. But you want to make our flesh gangrenous? No, that's not what it's saying. If something has gangrene, you can't use it. You can't bend a big toe that has gangrene. It's that the muscles, the tissues, the nerves, it's already gone. Right? It's just still attached to you. It doesn't have an impact on you. If you stub that toe, you don't feel it. Right? It is of no effect to you and the rest of your body. Well, what's he saying by mortifying the deeds of the flesh? You get the flesh to the point to where the cares of the flesh don't bother you no more. The desire and the pull of the flesh doesn't have sway over you anymore. Right? It's still attached to you because as long as we're in this flesh, it's going to be a part of us. But we truly do mortify it, meaning that we don't feel them things anymore. The things that used to pull after the flesh, now we can pull the flesh in a different direction. Right? If we do something that offends the flesh, right, or bucks up against the flesh, if we were to stub it against the Word of God, it don't pain us because we know that's the truth. The flesh doesn't recoil at it because the flesh has been put under subjection. Well, what's the whole point of that process? So that we can follow after God without hindrance. As the apostle wrote, laying aside those weights which do so easily beset us, what's that that's mortifying the flesh because it's easy for that sucker to rear up its ugly head right? it's easy for that sucker to pull against our spirit 
It's easy for there to be conflict down here between our spirit and the spirit of the world, the desires of our flesh, right? Sometimes even our own desires. There's so many ways that we can be beset by those weights. But the only way to overcome them is to mortify the flesh. Right? But notice, it doesn't say that you can mortify your flesh. Look at verse number 13 again. But if ye through the Spirit, capital S, do mortify the deeds of your body. You know who puts your flesh under subjection? The Spirit. That's not, you know, that's an if and then statement. You know what that is? That's a promise. If ye do, the Spirit will. God has promised that if we allow the Spirit to mortify the deeds of our flesh, He'll do it. You know the only thing that stops Him from doing that? Your Spirit. It is an act of faith that God will do what He said He will do. You cannot mortify your flesh. You know what you can do? You can take up your cross and follow after Jesus. Jesus only used the cross once. He didn't have need for it after that. But yet he told those that followed after him to take up their cross and follow him. Why is that? Because I've got this thing that I'm carrying around that I can't get rid of. But it's been made, you know, it's been mortified by the Spirit. What's that mean? It's been put under subjection. What do you think's on that cross? The old man. My flesh. That thing that I'm trying to keep at an arm's length away so that it doesn't deter me. I got to take it somewhere with me, but I don't want it to be a part of me. Don't want it to be a part of the new man. Right? I didn't nail the flesh to the cross. Guess who did that? The Spirit. Who put my flesh under subjection? The Spirit. And why did it happen? Because I asked him to in faith, believing that he would, and then got out the way. I didn't grieve and didn't quench the Spirit. I allowed the Spirit to do his handiwork, which is what? To make us into that new creature. He made us alive inwardly in our souls so that in our spirit we could purpose to live as that new creature. But here, according to your King James Bible, in order to do so, what do we have to do? The Spirit has to mortify our flesh. So with the Lord's help this morning, we're going to talk about the specifics of revival. Too often we talk about revival as a general thing. We say, pray for revival. We say, God's a very specific God. God told you here specifically what it took for you to live a life pleasing unto Him. And a new cre- He didn't leave anything out. Why do you think that so many times the Apostle Paul wrote to young preach, preach the whole counsel of the Word of God. Study to be thyself approved unto God. Which applies to everybody, not just preachers, by the way. But we ought to know the whole counsel. Why? Because God in His whole counsel gave you every tool that you need to live a life that's pleasing unto Him. So you want to be revived? We're going to start having to get specific with God. We've got to start not just saying, well, Lord, send revival. We've got to start asking, Lord, what about me keeps revival from coming? We've got to stop just asking the Lord to do it because, again, God promised He would do it. So if God has not done it, it's not God's fault. There's something preventing God from doing what God wants to do. What's that? The will of man. Because, again, I can't make somebody else revived. I can't remember how long ago it was, but I got up once. And we only talked for about 15 minutes that day, if I remember. But it was all about teaching. Hey, all the preaching we heard this week, I can't help you on what you need. God can tell you what you need. But you just got to get serious enough with God to ask Him, listen, until He answers. Right? We got up and talked on simply getting out the way. And then, I don't know what everybody else did, but I went over there in the altar for about 30 minutes. But what was the point of that? I don't have the key for your revival. You know who does? You. You know who I have the key to revival for? Me. And that's it. Right? Last week, we, we preached Sunday night. 
about how revival is a specific thing. We want it collectively. We want the church to be revived. We want the community to be revived. But I can't make the church be revived. We each have to individually make the choice that I want to be revived. The specifics of revival are you could pray for a community revival all you want, but God can't give you revival for a community. God can give you revival for you. The specifics of revival are that, yes, we'd love to see everybody get in on it, but I can't affect you. I can't make decisions for you. I can't impact your spirit like we already talked about. I can't change your mind. All I can do is affect me. You know who can have an impact on you? The spirit. You want to know who can't have an impact on you? Any of the preachers that are going to be up here this week? Any of the singing that's going to be up here this week? Right? It could be perfect and in line in the perfect will of God for everything said this week to be done it's not going to have an impact you unless you let the spirit impact you with it everything else can go perfectly according to God's plan and yet God's will not be done in your life not because of somebody else but because of what you do with it sound familiar everything that Jesus did from the alpha of time until Calvary was in the perfect will of God yet there are people still dying on their way to hell today that's not God's fault he did everything that it took to redeem fallen man it's what people do with what God has done that truly makes an impact on their life but specifically when we start talking about revival it's about you being revived not about the church being revived Yes, of course, we'd love to see everybody in the church be in a state of revival all the time. But I can't impact them. I can only have an impact on me. I can't change their life. God can change their life. But they have to allow God to change their life. So, when we, you know, God being a specific God, right? When we start praying specifically, you know what that does? It cultivates a burden. It's real easy to look at something generally and it not affect you. But if you zoom out far enough, you don't see the details and it doesn't affect you too much. But if you ask the Lord, Lord, put me under a microscope. Show me what I need to do to get out of the way so that your spirit can make me what I ought to be. Then he's going to start showing you things that are going to make you uncomfortable. Not your spirit, it's going to make your flesh uncomfortable. You start praying specifically, Lord, we need to address this because you've revealed it to me either through your word or through preaching, but ultimately through the spirit because the word is spiritually discerned. And preaching only has an impact on people because the Holy Ghost takes what somebody was faithful to teach or preach and then impacts somebody else's heart with it. But the spirit reveals to you a need and convinces you that it's important to God and it should be important to you. That's what a burden is. God purposes in your heart that it's something worth doing something about. Right? Whether it's somebody going to the mission field or whether it's somebody coming to an altar and saying, Lord, there may not be anything sinful about it, but you've revealed to me that this is too important to me. Regardless of what it is, a burden is God telling you it's important enough to pay attention to. Burdens change the way that you live. Right? Truly, a burden will not just affect your heart, but we know out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And we know that we live after the desires of our heart. You want revival to come? You're going to have to get a burden. But... You may be burdened about people in the community that need revival, but it's never coming to your, the doorstep of your heart until you realize that you need revival. The Spirit can never quicken us spiritually until we recognize all the things that are keeping us from being quickened. It's great to show up in a few services where you know it gets real high, where the Lord shows up and the big man does all the preaching. Right, where we walk out saying, we ain't never seen it on that fashion. 
right? Something miraculous took place that night. But why doesn't it stay around? Because everything that was done, we didn't let the Spirit affect our spirit. We didn't get a burden for what we were lacking. That all the times we, we look at what we have. Well, Lord, I'm real good at doing this and doing that and doing this. And the Lord may say, that's true. But the thing keeping you from being here is X, Y, and Z. We don't want to think about that. Now, Lord, let's just look at the things that you're happy with. Right, Lord, let's just look at the things that I've learned to do. Well, show me chapter and verse where once you get to a certain point, you can stop trying. You want to know why you're not going to find that? Because you're not the one that's doing anything. Right, we yield ourselves to be used of God. Everything in your Bible points to the fact that all we do is get out the way we're supposed to be light to the world. Why? So that they, the Holy Ghost can reveal to them where they really are. Right? We're supposed to be messengers to take them the good news of the gospel. Why? So that the Holy Ghost can deal with their heart. Right? You're not going to get saved until the Holy Ghost shows you that you're lost. Right? And you're not going to believe on Jesus if you've never heard of him before. There are those that have heard of him, but they don't know what he can do for them. That's our, what are we? We are instruments. Right? We're newspapers. Right? Some of us are newspaper barkers. Here, look at what the Lord gave me to tell you. Right? Like back in all the old black and white movies, extra, extra, read all about it. That's us. We didn't write the newspaper. We didn't print the newspaper. Right? We can't read the newspaper for somebody else. We're just there to deliver them what God delivered to us. Right? In our daily lives, we yield and say, Lord, by faith, I believe that if I live the life that I'm supposed to, you can take my good deeds, let other people see them, and they'll glorify my Father, which is in heaven. Why? Because Jesus preached it in Matthew 5. That's why I believe it. He said, you don't do good deeds to reap. You do good deeds because that's what God expects. But when we get back to the specifics of revival, according to these verses... There's only two states for a saved person to be in. You either live after the flesh or you live after the spirit. Now notice that word live. That is a verb. But what are verbs? They are actions. Too often we convince ourselves that there's some neutral area in between where we're just not having an impact negative or positive on anything. We're in the middle. Right, that we call a timeout and we're no longer playing the game. We're sitting on the bench and we're not having any impact on what's going on. That's not what your Bible says. You either live after the Spirit or live after the flesh. They're both actions. By not living after the Spirit, you live after the flesh. By not living after the flesh, you're living after the Spirit. Again, Jesus taught, man cannot serve two masters. He'll love one, hate the other. There is no straddling the fence. It's either progress towards what God wants you to be spiritually, or you're losing ground. You cannot find a spot where you just say, Lord, let me sit here for a while. There are times that God will tell you to take a seat and rest, but you're still living after the Spirit because He told you to take a seat. There are times that God's going to tell you to sit down, and you want to keep going it's because he knows that you need rest but if I keep going not living after the spirit anymore he told me sit what's our one rule mind the Lord that's not just while we're here that's permanently living after the spirit is permanently in everything that you do doing what the spirit tells you to do you want to know why we need revival? Because we don't do that 100% of the time. In fact, most people don't do it hardly at all. Well, how can you say that, Brother Jordan? Because of the way that the world's in. There was a time that those that lived righteously had an impact on the community and things weren't done in open. Things had to be done in secret because if people knew about it, they'd have kicked them out of society because they didn't want them impacting the world that God wanted them to have. 
people were corrected people were rebuked nowadays you say anything about anybody else it's considered a hate crime how do we get to that state people stop saying this is what's right huh? let me get to verse number 6 Romans chapter number well, let's start in verse number 5 for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh that's why living after the flesh it's an action but because you do the things of the flesh you mind the flesh it says but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because to live after the flesh to mind the flesh you're living after that thing that's dead you're obeying or you're giving in to impulses and desires of something that only has desires for those things that are dead your flesh doesn't desire after the things of God you know what it desires after? the world because it's carnal well, verse number 7 for the carnal mind is enmity against God to mind the flesh to be carnally minded is to be the enemy of God there is no time out there is no sidelines anything that is of the world goes against everything that the spirit wants to make you into to embrace it is to kill off those things that are made alive they're to put them back under subjection but we put ourselves back into bondage verse number 8 so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God you know what revival is admitting to God Lord I understand that my life does not please you all the time we're getting to specifics once you realize that if you get a burden about it you'll start asking the Lord well Lord what doesn't please you then you'll ask him Lord I know I brought those things into my life but I understand that I can't mortify the deeds of the body on my own so Lord take the spirit and remove those things from my life remove the desire mortify those attachments that I have to those things because when you start getting specific it's because you've got a burden and the Bible tells me that God is near those of a contrite spirit he's near to those that are burdened for his honor and his glory you saying that God won't answer general prayers no but I'm saying when you start praying specifically it's because God has burdened you specifically and if God's revealed it, it means he wants to do something about it I'm just saying if you've got a burden about something that God's revealed to you specifically if you pray specifically right, if you have the burden because God revealed it to you and you pray it because you want to be in line with God's spirit something Bible to pick up something's about ready to change right, well look with me in verse number 9 ye are not in the flesh but in the spirit used to all we had was that fleshly nature God sees us in the spirit because we're robed in the righteousness of Christ God sees us as we will be right when you got saved your new de facto state was that new creature alive in the spirit right having been made alive not by anything we did but by everything that he did so he says but ye are in the spirit nothing can change that fact right make some people angry they, they're already angry right? but you can't lose it once God gives it to you you can lose it if you did it but his right he says it it's forever settled in heaven he does it it's permanent right? we're not relying on what we did we're just relying on the fact that God gave us enough sense after he revealed to us that we had the ability to ask him to save us Right? but even that little bit of faith where did it come from God gave unto every man a measure of faith right? he made sure that there was nothing that could prevent you from believing on the name of his only begotten son 
So afterwards, he made you alive. Right? Your soul, your spirit, been made alive for forevermore. Nothing can change it. You're in the spirit. But just because you're in something doesn't mean you're living after something. That's the whole point of the verses. He says, but in the spirit, if so, that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You know what that's saying? As long as you're saved, nothing can separate you from the Holy Ghost. He says that's what makes you one of God's, is that he lives in you. So why do, why are we now just reading this verse? Because the only prerequisite in order to be revived is that the Spirit is a part of you and can mortify the deeds, which are in you, mortify the flesh. Right? The old man. Right? Well, by this verse, as long as you're saved, you got the Holy Ghost and nothing can change that. We've thrown everything that it takes to be revived. It's a work of God. It's not a decision that we make for a short time. No, 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 no. It is a change of your life, not by mortal hands, not by mortal preaching, not by the words of a man, but because the Holy Ghost of God got a hold of your heart and changed something. So all it takes to be revived is that God does the work. We've already shown that the only thing that it takes in order to be revived is that the Holy Ghost is still a part of you. Nothing that we can do could ever separate us from the Holy Ghost after we've been saved. So what prevents revival? Specifics. Specific things. Not general things. But Lord, show me where I've you know, where I need to improve. Doesn't sound very burdened to me. Right? Because if you ask God, God's going to answer specifically. And today's specific may be different from tomorrow's specific. Because if we get the, that part of the flesh nailed to the cross, we hold it out and we say, Lord, here it is. Mortify it. Right? Tomorrow it may be something else specific. Right? We may have become lax in certain areas and something's getting ready to hop off the cross that was nailed to it. We've got to go back and say, Lord, mortify it again. Lord, drive another nail down in this. Lord, I know you gave me this verse last time, but Lord, give me a different verse to keep this thing nailed to the cross. Right? When we start getting specific, God starts acting in specifics. The specifics of revival that God wants to send revival collectively. But when you realize that He wants to revive you, it becomes personal. You want to know why you got saved? Because you realized that you personally needed a Savior. You want to know why you got saved? Because God personally wanted to save you. You didn't have to wait for somebody else to get on board so that God could save both of you at the same time. The only thing keeping me from being revived is me. The only thing keeping you from being revived is you. It's not contingent on anybody else. It's not contingent upon what message is preached. It's not contingent upon who gets up and sings. You could be revived now if you sought after it. Right? Revival, there's no secret series of events that have to happen for God to do something miraculous. God does everything miraculous. It's just how He is. Everything He does is supernatural. Everything He does is with omnipotence and all power. Right? It takes a miraculous thing to be revived, but God's already laid everything out just like He did with salvation. There wasn't anything missing. There wasn't anything that we had to wait on. In fact, He gave us the earnest of the Spirit. Why? So that we could stay revived after we got saved. Now you saying you're always going to be 100% in line with the Spirit of God? Ideally. Right? But i got this flesh to deal with. I'm an imperfect person. But you know what he promised? That he'd mortify that part of the flesh when it starts rearing its head again. Why? So that I can follow after him. Because to live in the Spirit, I must follow the Spirit. Can't follow the Spirit if I'm living after the flesh. Right? But when we get into those specifics... I don't know what those specifics are for you. I can't know those specifics for you. 
All that God entrusted me with was knowing what God wanted me to do. Right? That's the other side of soul liberty. God saved you to make you free. Verse number one, there's therefore now no condemnation. You know what that means? If the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. You're not under bondage anymore. You know what the living after the flesh will do? Put you back in bondage. Right? So liberty is he made you personally free. You have to keep yourself following after the Spirit. God didn't save you and make you into a robot. You still had that same free will that you had when you asked him to save you. Right? Well, we have to will to live after the Spirit. That's not going to happen while the flesh is still around. You want to know why meeting after meeting, whether it's camp meeting, whether it's revival, whether it's a little weekend meeting that God pops up somewhere, you want to know why all those times that God's shown up, that it hadn't stuck? Because the flesh wasn't mortified. He showed up and showed us what we could have. Week in, week out, we hear preaching on what we need. But why doesn't anything change? Because in our body, nothing changes. Until this changes, nothing out there is going to change. Until we get purpose that we specifically need God to do something for us, God can't use us to make an impact on anybody else. He said there's no condemnation. You know what that means? If you live after the Spirit... Doesn't matter what the world says against you. In the eyes of God, nothing can condemn you. My soul, already, right, sealed for forever, nothing can condemn that. But now he's talking about in the flesh, our deeds. He's saying you can live a life where there's no condemnation from God towards you. You know what the sad reality is? Most of the time, we can't live in the perfect will of God and receive the choicest blessings from God. Not because God doesn't want to send it, but because we've put ourselves back in bondage. And as such, we're under condemnation from God. Because He said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. We know that. Even if you didn't hear the preaching or you hadn't gotten around to that verse before today, you know inwardly that you ought to be like Christ why because God put that desire in you when he saved you the new man desires to live after Christ because that's the one that birthed him right, but we know be ye holy for I am holy the Bible says that God chastens those that he loves you know what that is God condemning your current actions Chastening has a progression. Right? There's some kids, all it takes from their parents is a snap of the fingers and a, hey, we told you not to do that. I'm disappointed in you. That's enough to break their will. Other kids, like my hard headed brother, had to have the devil beat out of them before they admitted they were wrong. Right? Turn around. He's smiling because he knows it's true. But there, there's a progression that God will show you that you're wrong. Until eventually God has to prove to you that you're wrong. That's a sad place to be. It's a hard place to be. Because in order to get to that point, you've had to live after the flesh a long ways away from the things of God. The good news is it's no less hard to have the flesh mortified out there than it is close to God. Because the act is not dependent on where we are or what it is that is being mortified. All it's contingent on is us giving it to God and God doing it. Well, you do realize that the Bible says he was tempted in all points like we are, yet was he without sin? Do you know why the Bible tells you that he was tempted in all points like us? So that he could be our high priest. Right, so that when we came to him, that he would be able to succor them that come after him. You know what that means? He overcame it all so that he could overcome it for you. He said, I mortified all the deeds of the world so that when you ask me to through the Holy Spirit, we can mortify it for you. 
We can make it of none effect anymore. We can make it to where it is truly dead. You see, our flesh may be alive and kicking right now, but from the moment it was conceived, it was dead. It knew it was going back to the ground. In the eyes of God, it's already there. But well, what's that mortification? That's just us purposing that you're going to die today. Stay dead so that the Spirit can live. We still use this thing made out of dirt for the honor and glory of God. But we mortify its wants, its intents, its deeds. We mortify its former actions by so that the new man can live through. Right? We're not living. We mortify the flesh to the cross and we just say, Lord, live through me. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul wrote? Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. How's that happen? The mortification process. But see, God doesn't just mortify the whole flesh. We have to yield it to Him, piece by piece. We have to be vigilant enough to inspect every day. Lord, something getting ready to jump off this thing? We got to go revisit anything over here? We've got to have enough humility to admit that we were wrong and ask God to make it right. We've got to have enough awareness to understand when we're being pulled by the flesh and pulled by the spirit. You know, that's called, that's called discernment. We want to know why our pastor preaches on discernment? Because it's real important for a Christian to know the difference between when it's something I want and when it's something God wants. You want to know why some people get up, testify, and God isn't within 100 miles of it? Because they don't know the difference between wanting to say something and God wanting you to say something. You want to know why some people never have an impact on it? Because they don't understand the difference between living the way that God wants them to live and living the way that they want to live. God will show you if you ask Him. But you got to get specific. Right? Not a flippant request. Lord, make me like your son. That's what He already desires. You're grieving God by saying, God, do all the work without any of the work. I want the uh, end result without any of the labor any of the process because he said right here's how you do it so you got to get specific and say Lord make this more like Christ because I know that this isn't Christ like Lord mortify this because I know it's what keeps me from being closer to you where you get real specific and say Lord show me those things so that I can be burdened about them and get so burdened that I want you to change it because God's real serious about sending revival. So in order for it to come, we've got to get real serious. You know when we get serious? When it becomes specific and personal. And we start receiving it, not as a message for the church. No, that was preached for me. This wasn't just a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Rome. No, God used the apostle Paul to pen this letter to me. Right? People are dying and going to hell because I'm not what I'm supposed to be for God. Because I know He can save them. He wants to save them. He's done everything to save them. If they haven't heard about it, it's not God's fault. Whose fault is it? I can't blame anybody else but me. Because the commission to go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, that wasn't just written to the people on the hill that day. God wrote that to me. When this becomes specific and personal, you start getting specific and personal burdens. You start specifically and personally asking God to change you so that He can do what He wants to do in your life. That's the specifics of revival. If you have that desire, revival will come, but revival will stay. It won't be a flash in the pan It'll be something that sticks around. What all impacts that? My will, your will. Somebody can't steal your revival if God gives it to you. You have to let them take it. Because it's personal. And it's specific. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. 
As always, thanks for listening.